I want to start with this. When I was teaching, I know it was extremely difficult to get my students to differentiate between the enslavement of Africans in the Atlantic world, which generally defines the idea of slavery for people in the US, um, and other forms of enslavement and coerced labor. And I worked, I will say, almost entirely without success to get them to disconnect the concept of servitude from their ideas about Blackness. I also, um, and so I thought it would be better, I thought it would be good if I could perhaps pry these two sets of ideas apart, um, that my students would be better able to see both the commonalities between different types of coercive systems and the uniqueness of each one. And so our first speaker today, I think, gets, a, gets us in that direction. He's a professor of history at UC Davis, as you may have um, seen on the uh, site for the for this event. Andres Resendez specializes in the histories of European exploration and colonization of the America of the Americas, the US Mexico border region and the early history of the Pacific. He's the author of a number of books focused on these histories. Um, I reached out to Dr. Resendez because of his 2016 book, which is called The Other Slavery. And I think this is a great place for us to start today because through this work that he's done, Professor Resendez offers a parallel system of enslavement in the Americas, or offers an understanding about that, a way to reconceptualize conquest of indigenous peoples and a different lens through which to understand resistance by indigenous nations. So with that, I will say welcome, Professor Resendez. Thank you so much, Shane, and thank you everybody for uh for joining us and for spending some time uh, with some of the work uh, that has been my passion for the last uh, few years. This is, as Shane was already uh, saying, what we think of when we think of slavery. Uh, the very word uh, brings to mind bodies of African stuffed in the hold of a ship um, or you know these kinds of movies, novels, et cetera, fully six, in, if you go into um, Amazon.com, fully 16,000 books uh, of all kinds uh, deal with African slavery in one form or another. However, um, of course, we, we know that in the long sweep of history, peoples other than Africans have been held in bondage. And this is what I tried to do um, in that recent book, The Other Slavery, which uh, focuses on uh, on the terrible system of bondage that targeted Native Americans, um, a system that was every bit as terrible and degrading as African slavery. And yet we uh, seem to know relatively little about that. Uh, um, when I started researching for this uh, book, I saw that there, are, there is scholarship going back more than a century about this, but somehow Indian slavery or uh, the Indian slave trade, et cetera, had always seemed like a fairly esoteric kind of a subject until maybe the last uh, two decades uh, when there has been a, um, a new uh, push to get this uh, history out. And so I thought it was the time was ripe to try to come up with a, with a big rethinking uh, and to, to, to try to provide the broad outlines uh, of these um, of this traffic of humans that, uh, according to my estimates, uh, ensnared anywhere between 2.5 and 5 million people from the time of, time of Columbus to 1900. Um, so, um, so I will have to start by emphasizing that Indian slavery was not a European invention. Uh, Mayas and Aztecs, as you know, took captives, as it's well known, took captives as sacrificial victims. Um, Iroquois people in what is now the United States waged campaigns on neighboring groups called mourning wars to avenge and replace uh, their dead. And in the Pacific Northwest out here where we live, um, uh, marriages, indigenous marriages often involve the exchange of captives. So as far back as we can peer into the documentary and archeological record here, I'm showing you, for example, the beautiful Codex Mendoza, which even though it was a post conquest, it used the pictorial conventions of pre-Columbian, pre-contact uh, traditions. 
And uh, the taking of captives was so common that you can see here, uh, it was the holding of somebody by the hair. And you can read the Spanish gloss here, cautivo, captive. Um, it was a pretty, a pretty common uh, thing. So, uh, so this occurred, um, you know, as far back as we can see and all over uh, the uh, hemisphere. But with the arrival of Europeans, these pre-existing practices of bondage that were originally embedded in very specific cultural contexts, such as the ones we are briefly alluding to here, became commercialized, expanded in unexpected ways, and came to resemble the kinds of human trafficking that we recognize today uh, in the fullness of time. And this transformation uh, began with the earliest European explorers. So Columbus himself, during his second voyage, uh, sent dozens of Native Americans from the Caribbean and accompanying them was a very candid letter addressed to the Spanish monarchs, his sponsors. And let me just read one, one line so you get a flavor of, of what the Admiral of the Ocean Sea was thinking. Um, and I quote, may your highnesses judge whether these Indians ought to be captured. For I believe we could take many of the males every year and an infinite number of women. And may you also believe that one of them would be worth more than three black slaves from Guinea in strength and ingenuity, as you will gather from those I am shipping out now. So it's, it's interesting because Indian slavery is in some ways the mirror opposite of African slavery. Um, African slavery targeted primarily adult males, uh, Indian slavery targeted primarily um, children and women, as we shall see. Um, and we can discuss about why Columbus believed that Native Americans would be worth as much as three uh, black slaves from Western Africa. Um, eventually, all European powers became important participants in the Indian slave trade. Uh, you know, the English did it, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese, but Spain, by virtue of the enormous and densely uh, populated colonies that it ruled became uh, the dominant slaving power or Indian slaving power. Spain was to Indian slavery what Portugal and later England were to African slavery. And it is a great irony that Spain began its participation in this human trade by actually forbidding the enslavement of Native Americans. Um, however, this categorical prohibition did not stop generations of determined settlers and conquistadors from taking natives truly on a planetary scale from Canada all the way to the tip of South America and from the Canary Islands in the Atlantic to the Spanish Philippines in the Pacific. So, uh, and the fact that this other slavery, as I call it, had to be carried out clandestinely ma made it even more insidious. So this is a, a, a tale of good intentions gone really uh, badly astray. So the uh, Caribbean was the laboratory of conquest as everything else with Spanish colonialism, Spain's fir very first home in the new world. And it was also quite likely the worst native slaving ground in the world. Uh, contact, uh, the Caribbean sustained a very large indigenous population, yet from this high point, a tragic demographic collapse followed. And so by the 1550s, nearly two generations after contact, the natives so memorably described by Columbus as, quote, affectionate and without malice and having, quote, very straight legs and no bellies, had actually ceased to exi exist as organized societies. There were a few bands of refugees, but basically uh, all of that had been destroyed. As any school child knows, smallpox uh, was a major reason for this devastation, but blaming everything on unintended um, biological factors is not borne out by the sources and it is just too simplistic. Um, Take, for instance, the island of Hispaniola right here, the, uh, the large island now shared by Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, 
Italian demographer Massimo Livibacci has recently made the crucial point that the first certain documentation of smallpox in Hispaniola on this island appears only in 1518. And yet, even though 26 years passed before the first documented case of smallpox began to appear, at least in the uh, Spanish record, the native population of the Caribbean found itself already on a clear path towards extinction. At contact, this large island, Hispaniola, may have had a population that we can reasonably estimate at maybe 200,000 uh, inhabitants, although very recent DNA research has shrunk this population to perhaps 100,000 or even 80,000. Uh, so clearly no Aztec empires or Inca empires um, uh, on this large island. But whatever the initial population you, you want to put, by, five, by 1508, that figure had fallen to 60,000. By 1514, it stood at merely 26,000, according to a fairly comprehensive census, uh, Spanish census and no longer guesswork. And by 1517, it had plunged to just 11,000. Native Americans inhabitants. In other words, one year before Europeans began reporting smallpox, Hispaniola's indigenous population had dwindled to, I don't know, five, ten percent or as, as little as two percent of what it had been in 1492. Of course, it is impossible to rule out completely the possibility of unreported epidemics, but it is also obvious that factors other than biology were at work. And of course, now we know after this pandemic that we've been living through, uh, we understand that epidemics are not just purely biological uh, phenomena. They are also social phenomena in very significant ways. Um, so we know that other things were, uh, were happening uh, in addition to, the, to these epidemics. Um, and, uh, and one of the things was that Hispaniola happened to have the largest gold deposits in the Circum-Caribbean region. Um, we know how that was done because Oviedo, uh, one of the most prolific Spanish chroniclers, was also involved in these uh, extractive industry um, and participated in, uh, in silver and gold mining in, um, and so he left us this sketch as well as a very close description of how that went on. So basically, uh, native peoples on this island would be uh, were formed into cuadrillas, as they were called in Spanish, so groups of workers, which were further subdivided uh, into three uh, groups. So the group represented by the figure to the right uh, would do some superficial digging, usually close to a river or a stream. A second group um, of workers would carry this uh, sand or this dirt on a large wooden pan called batea that you can see uh, on the head of the figure in the middle. Um, and it would, they would, their task would be to transport that to a third group of natives, often women, who would be in the stream uh, and would, would submerge the batea and would wash away uh, the uh, dirt until just the little nuggets of gold would remain at the bottom. This doesn't sound too bad, uh, e except that uh, this was an unceasing kind of work that could go on for 12, 14, 16, 18 hours a day, uh, leaving very little room to do everything else for the survival and the reproduction of that indigenous population. Um, and so by the early 15 teens, so it was just a decade, the first gold rush in the Americas, uh, a decade of sheer uh, horror in that, uh, that the indigenous peoples of Hispaniola plunged so drastically, but that, you know, it was necessary to bring people from elsewhere. And we saw, we see, um, I said that Indian slavery was prohibited by the Spanish crown, except in a few circumstances uh, in, the, in the early uh, period. And so I was able to use some of the, uh, so, so slavers use these loopholes in order to launch slaving raids in the rest of the Caribbean. Um, and on the basis of those permits, I was able to, um, to, uh, to construct this map. 
that tells you where the slavers were originating in the large islands of Jamaica, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and later on in Cuba, where the gold was. And it was launched to smaller islands that had no gold, but had uh, people that, uh, that, that needed to be transported to places where they would be far more valuable. Um, so, uh, so this is how the cataclysm that initially befell Española uh, essentially spread all over the Caribbean. Okay, so gold uh, was the initial impetus for these other slavery, as I call it. Um, and in the United States, when we think of gold, of course, the unavoidable reference is to the California gold rush. Altogether, California produced some 3.7 million kilograms of gold and in the process attracted some 300,000 people from the rest of the world. So clearly a major phenomenon. But the exploitation of silver, a pre, uh, pre-California gold, gold rush, uh, silver uh, rush is really uh, the preeminent slavery, uh, acti Indian slavery activity in the new world. And I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes giving you a sense of proportion because again, uh, we don't necessarily know too much. So this is the California gold rush in terms of volume and in terms of time it started, uh, it was, you know, it started in uh, 14, uh, in, 19, in 1848, 49, uh, and within 20 years it dwindled quite uh, dramatically. Um, in contrast, these pre, uh, this previous silver um, rush um, began in the 1520s. It kind of continued through the 16th century. It plateaued during the 17th century and it got a second wind uh, in the 18th century. In many years, in the second half of the 18th century, uh, the silver mines of northern Mexico were producing over half of all the silver produced in the entire world. So uh, in terms of duration, uh, it was much longer, uh, and uh, in terms of volume, uh, just sheer kilograms of silver unearthed from the ground, uh, it was 44.2 million kilograms, or about 12 times the, uh, the gold extracted from California. So what you have to imagine is 12 California gold rushes strung out in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century to get a sense of what we are talking about. Um, I can also show you a little bit of where these silver mines were. Um, so, uh, so it was a very uh, large phenomenon, and this is just uh, uh, just just counting. Uh, so, so it was a fantastic phenomenon. And if this had occurred in the 19th century, Mexico would have become a worldwide magnet like California, attracting non-coerced or voluntary laborers, who, laborers in an era of newspapers, steamboats, and widespread transoceanic travel, there is little doubt that the great Mexican silver mines would have lured immigrants from all the quarters of the world. But because this boom predated all of these communications and transportation conveniences and unfolded at a time when the Spanish monarchy actually prohibited all foreigners from going to the silver districts, Mexico had to do with its own human resources, especially Native Americans. California attracted 300,000 people, yet colonial Mexico had to satisfy a hugely greater labor demand with no access to volunteers from the rest of the world. So uh, the indigenous peoples who lived in and around the mines were the first to be pulled into the quote unquote system and so Spanish soldiers and volunteers rounded them up and sold them to the miners for 30 to 50 pesos a piece. And when the local indigenous communities became depleted, mining entrepreneurs looked farther afield and they brought natives from a catchment area that eventually extended as far north as California, New Mexico, and Texas. This is a picture taken by a, an American mining engineer in 1905 in one of those silver mines in Mexico, in La Valenciana. Um, just to give you a sense of the conditions that existed as late as 1905, 
Uh, so these are called tenateros because their job is to bring the ore. Uh, so, so let me just say a couple of things. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but unlike gold mining that required some superficial digging, silver mining was a lot more difficult on top of everything else because typically uh, silver is found in uh, veins and they needed to be followed usually way down. Uh, these mines, for example, uh, the La Valenciana, when it was finished in the early 18th century, it was considered the deepest man-made shaft in the world. Um, and so you have to follow the vein, you have to bring the ore uh, up, and this was done uh, through ladders. So the workers had to have their hands free, and they had to, base while, while carrying uh, these uh, 40, 60, 80 pounds of ore uh, stuffed in fiber bags that were dangled in their foreheads. That was important because they needed to have their hands free in order to hold on to the ladders in order to get out of the, uh, of the mine. And that was only the beginning. Once the ore was out of the mine, then they had to crush this to a very fine powder. They had to mix that uh, with very dangerous reagents, uh, most notably mercury. This was the way to refine the silver. Um, this had to be mixed. Uh, some of the, the worst assignments consisted of mixing uh, these sl this toxic sludge. Uh, oftentimes, uh, indigenous peoples who were sentenced to death were forced to do that with their own feet. Um, and thus they ended up their lives within a year or a year and a half with uh, uncontrollable convulsions because of uh, um, mercury poisoning, which attacks the nervous system. Um, so um, so this was the, uh, the world that this was the world that we are looking at. And as I said, uh, as these indigenous peoples close to the mines became depleted, um, uh, traffickers um, went farther afield into what is now the United, uh, you know, regions of what what is now the United States. Um, these connections, these mining connections and slaving connections between what is now Mexico and the silver mines of Mexico and what is now the American Southwest explain a great deal that otherwise would be difficult to explain. For instance, uh, in the summer of 1680, the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico rose up and launched the most massive rebellion Spanish experienced, the Spaniards experienced in North America since the early days of conquest. The nervous center of this movement was the Pueblo of Taos in northeastern New Mexico at the very top. You can see that in that map. Um, from inside a kiva or underground chamber used for ceremonial locations, a local shaman named Pope dispatched runners to more than 70 indigenous communities, some of them as far as present-day Hopi Reservation in Arizona, some 300 miles away. Um, and Pope's plan was to get all of these indigenous communities to rise up on the same day to overwhelm the much smaller Spanish population living in this region. And to this end, uh, these runners, because they were not able to, they were prohibited from riding horses. So they had to go running, literally, in the punishing heat of the, you know, the summer heat of New Mexico. They were carrying an extraordinary device, a cord of yucca fiber containing as many knots as there were days before the insurrection. By untying one knot every day, each community would know exactly when to strike. And thus the revolt uh, swept through New Mexico on August 10 and 11, 1680, indeed destroying houses, ranches, and churches, and succeeding mightily. Within two months, all Spaniards living in New Mexico were either dead or, or had been driven out of the territory. An astounding two-thirds of all the missionaries working in New Mexico were, uh, were killed during this uprising. And so writers have emphasized the religious aspect of the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. And they have focused on the charismatic Pope and his ability to coordinate so many Pueblos that were so fiercely independent from one another. 
Um, these authors ha have also been rightly impressed by the burning and defacing of churches during the, uh, during the insurrection and the torturing and killing of friars, uh, which again happened and is very vividly documented. Um, however, in, in my work, I try to make the case that uh, while religion was certainly a factor, the enslavement of New Mexican natives played a major role in triggering this massive rebellion. So again, uh, for one thing, rebellious leaders explicitly, explicitly talked about it. One of the demands of the rebels, and there were very few opportunities for the rebels to actually express the demands to the Spanish who were mostly fleeing. Uh, so one of, the, one of these rare contacts, um, you know, the, one of the rebel leaders ex expressly said that, uh, demanded that, and I quote, all classes of Indians forcibly held by the Spaniards be given back. Um, another rebellion leader asked, and I quote, that his wife and children be given up to him. And likewise, that all the Apache men and women whom the Spaniards had captured in war turned over to them. Finally, and this is the slide that you are seeing here, the geography of the uprising is quite suggestive about the importance of the Indian slave trade. Um, although the uprising is uh, generally known as the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, the movement actually encompassed a large swath of territory along the slaving corridor leading south from New Mexico to the mining region of Chihuahua and west to Sonora. So if you look at uh, this, this is the uh, mining town and you know, hosting a very significant silver uh, town of uh, mine of Parral, which essentially is structured life for a very large region. And so you can see uh, all of these um, slaving corridors as I, as I uh, call them, um, going from New Mexico into southern Chihuahua and, and into this mine, and also from uh, Sonora, uh, from the west into these, and also from the east, of also uh, from neighboring Coahuila, uh, from the west, from the east, sorry. Um, so, so you can see the very clear um, overlap of the areas that up ultimately erupted in rebellion and the pre-existing slaving corridors, which again, quite uh, revealing uh, of what uh, may have happened. One of the most fascinating aspects of the phenomenon of Indian slavery is the involvement of Native Americans themselves. They participated, Native Americans participated in the slaving enterprise since the very beginning of European colonization indeed seems well before the European colonization. But uh, when Europeans arrived, they first uh, played uh, secondary roles to the Europeans who after all possess the more developed warfare technologies, especially horses and firearms. And so indigenous peoples became local suppliers of slaves, junior partners, guides, guardsmen, and intermediaries. But with the passage of time, Native Americans came to acquire European weaponry and horses. And as they increased their power and warfare capabilities, they came to control a larger share of the traffic in natives. And so by the 18th and 19th centuries, they, in some parts of the Americas, had taken uh, control of much of the business. We can see that with the Carib Indians in what is now uh, Northern South America. And we can see that also in what is now the American Southwest. And in this region, no other indigenous nation attained the spectacular success of the Comanche, uh, the Comanche Confederation, uh, which became the preeminent supplier of indigenous slaves, both to other Native Americans as well to European colonists in the region, the Spanish, the French of Louisiana, and the English further north. So their expansive territory of the Comanches, the Comancheria as it was known by the Spanish, uh, wedged between Texas and New Mexico that you, you can see there, became a major trading center as recent work by historians such as Pekka Hamalain and Brian DeLay, Joaquin Rivalla Martinez and others have made quite clear. 
and lo let me just cite a couple, uh, a couple of eyewitnesses to give you a flavor of what this was like. So according to one witness in 1744, Comanche trading partners traveled more than a thousand leagues from New Mexico, so about 3,000 miles uh, in the course of a year, acquiring captives and returning to offer their loot in the trading fairs of New Mexico. One missionary recorded the enthusiasm caused by the arrival of one of such trading embassies. And here, let me just quote you this brief line. Here, the governor and his lieutenants gathered together as many horses, metal tools, and everything possible as they can for trade and barter with these barbarians in exchange for deer and buffalo hides. And what is saddest, in exchange for Indian slaves, men and women, small and large, a great multitude of people. For Comanches themselves, the Indian slave trade was not just a business, but actually a way of life. Uh, Comanches sold some of their slaves, but they retained a large proportion of their captives as well. One witness noted that, and I quote, nearly every family among the Comanches has one or two captives. Many of the captives were women who were incorporated into Comanche society as secondary wives and were put to work immediately. Comanche men hunted bison, but the women were the ones who processed the dead animals, preparing the meat and curing the hides, an extraordinarily labor-intensive activity. And so successful Comanche men could have five, 10, or more wives. So this was one stream of captives in Comanche society. But in addition to women, there were also boys, another very significant stream. Uh, and their main occup occupation consisted of tending the animals, the horses and the mares. As Comanches grew stronger, they accumulated uh, horses and mules, etc. And managing all of these herds required a great deal of labor that neither warriors nor women were able to provide. And so it was not uncommon for these boy slaves to be in charge of 50, 100, or 150 uh, horses or more grueling work that required constant vigilance and enormous stamina, especially during the winter months. So for Comanches and other groups, I mean, I'm using Comanches as an example, a very well-documented example, but Utes, Navajos, and others uh, also participated in this. For all of these groups, slaves constituted a very versatile commodity that could be used as an exploited underclass, as pawns that could be exchanged for kin members captured by other groups, um, or simply as the most ubiquitous form of currency in the region. Uh, remember, there was very little silver at this point, and so um, the exchange of captives was a very, uh, very obvious way to conduct, um, to, to barter in this region. Okay, so Indian slavery engulfed the entire continent. But the timing varied depending on the region. By the 19th century, Indian slavery had nearly disappeared in the Eastern seaboard. In colonial times, the Carolinas had been a major Indian slaving ground with tens of, uh, tens of thousands of natives, uh, you know, made enslaved in the 17th century. Similarly, further north, New Englanders had impressed rebellious Indians, you know, in King Philip's wars and others, in other words, and had shipped them to, uh, to the Caribbean where these people had uh, spent their lives as slaves. And even further north uh, in the French, uh, you know, in New France, uh, French colonists uh, procured thousands of native captives, some of them from the interior, uh, reaching all the way into the Great Lakes region. However, during the 18th and early 19th centuries, the traffic of natives was largely replaced and overshadowed by African slavery in the Eastern seaboard. Yet out here in the West, um, slavery continued to thrive during the 19th century. And the best evidence comes from letters and diaries of westbound Americans. In New Mexico, for example, James S. Calhoun, the first Indian agent of the territory of New Mexico, could not hide his amazement at the sophistication of the Indian slave market. And I quote him, again, just one line. 
the value of the captives depends upon age, sex, beauty, and usefulness, wrote Calhoun. Good-looking females not having passed the sear and yellow leaf are valued from $50 to $150 each. Males, as they may be useful, one half less, never more. Um, there was a price, a very significant price premium for women uh, of 50 or 60 percent with in comparison to adult males. And this held not only for this region, for what is now the American Southwest, but also for Chile or the Caribbean. And that is from the 16th century to the 19th century, a, a price premium that we can talk about uh, later on if you want. Um, so this is New Mexico, but it was hardly the only place. So California may have entered the Union as a free soil state, but American settlers soon discovered that the buying and selling of natives was a common practice out here. As early as 1846, the first American commander of San Francisco acknowledged, and I quote him, that certain persons have been and still are imprisoning and holding to service Indians against their will. Uh, the American commander also warned the general public that, and I quote him again, the Indian population must not be regarded in the light of slaves. His pleas, however, went unheeded, and the first California legislature went on to pass the Indian Act of 1850, which authorized the arrest of quote unquote vagrant natives who could then be quote unquote hired out to the highest bidder. This act also enabled white persons to go before a justice of the peace to obtain Indian children for indenture, again, quote unquote. And in fact, according to one scholarly estimate, the Indian Act of 1850 may have affected as many as 20,000 California natives, including 4,000 children kidnapped from their parents and used primarily as domestic servants and farm laborers. Again, California and New Mexico were not the only ones. Uh, Mormon settlers arrived in Utah in the 1840s um, only to discover that uh, Native Americans and Mexicans who were living in the region had already turned the Great Basin into a great slaving ground. Uh, the area was like a gigantic moonscape of bleached sand, salt flats, and mountain ranges inhabited by small, very small bands, no larger than extended families. And early travelers and early Anglo-American travelers did not hide their contempt for these. They were called quote unquote digger Indians who were lacking in horses and weapons, uh, not realizing that environmentally it made no sense to actually keep horses because horses eat the same grasses on which these native groups were surviving. So it was basically impossible to to keep uh, the horses. It was much better to kill them and eat them. Uh, but in any case, these vulnerable Paiutes had become easy prey for mounted Indians from further east, especially Utes. And Brigham Young and his followers, by virtue of establishing themselves in the region, became the most obvious outlet for such captives. And so hesitant at first, Mormons required some encouragement and slavers thus tortured children with knives or hot irons to call attention to their trade or threatened to kill any child that went unpurchased. Brigham Young's son-in-law, uh, Charles Deckard, witnessed the execution of a native girl before he agreed to exchange his gun for another captive. So in the end, uh, Mormons became buyers and even found a way to rationalize their participation in this human market. And I quote Brigham Young, who said, buy up the Lamanite children. He called them Lamanites, but Native Americans. And I can explain why that made sense in, in the more Mormon uh, rendition of the history of these regions. But buy up the Lamanite children and educate them and teach them the gospel so that many generations will not pass before they should become a white and delightsome people. And so if you look at this statement by Brigham Young, it was exactly the same logic that Spanish conquistadors had used since the 16th century in order to justify the acquisition of Native Americans. So persistent and widespread, and I'm wrapping this up pretty soon, um, 
was the uh, uh, Indian slavery that ending it proved nearly impossible. The Spanish crown had prohibited Indian uh, native bondage under all circumstances as early as 1542 with the so-called new laws. Um, and we can go into that history uh, in, in more detail. Yet the traffic continued to retain mastery over their, uh, their slaves. European owners resorted to a variety of euphemisms and subterfuges that amounted to slavery in all but name. They no longer kept slaves, they kept Indians in deposit or they, that they resorted to many other terms and we can talk about those. Another attempt at abolition occurred in the early 19th century when the newly independent Republic of Mexico prescribed all forms of native bondage and extended citizenship rights to all Native Americans living within the Mexican territory, yet Indian slavery persisted. And of course, one more opportunity arose immediately after the American Civil War. The US Congress passed the 13th Amendment, which prohibited both slavery and involuntary servitude, as you are saying there. And this formulation opened the possibility of liberation for all Native Americans held in bondage, especially in the Western territories. However, uh, in various rulings in the 1870s and 1880s, the Supreme Court opted for a narrow interpretation of the 13th and 14th Amendments that applied primarily to African Americans and generally excluded Native Americans. As you know, uh, Native Americans did not receive full-fledged citizenship rights until the 1920s. Um, the most common form of enslavement that persisted in the West uh, was peonage. So that is a, a system in which uh, individuals could not leave the place of work until they completely liquidated the debts. So owners would essentially advance uh, money or in sometimes in goods. Uh, and this would essentially bind people to ranches, mines and other operations. And this was the main way in which the other slavery operated in the West and in many other parts of the Americas and indeed in many other parts of the world. And so Congress actually passed the so-called Peonage Act of 1867, which was another step in the right direction. But once again, the written word alone was not enough to eliminate these practices. And so forms of peonage and enslavement persisted uh, through the rest of the 19th century and well into the 20th century uh, in some remote regions in, the, in New Mexico and elsewhere um, in, in the American West. Today, tens of millions of people in 167 countries live in some form of modern slavery, according to some of the latest estimates by the Walk Free Foundation. Slavery is forbidden all over the world, yet not a single region of our globe has been spared uh, from this phenomenon. Slavery continues to thrive because its beneficiaries resort to debts or prison sentences or some other subterfuge to compel people to work under the threat of violence and offering absurdly low or no compensation. And with this growing awareness about present day slavery, um, I want to end by emphasizing uh, that there's really very little new about these new forms of slavery. The 400 year experience of Native Americans with this that I call the other slavery um, offers a very direct forerunner to the kinds of uh, enslavement that we see today. So uh, slavery that is formally forbidden, yet, uh, yet it occurs on the ground with euphemisms uh, behind closed doors, in sweatshops, um, et cetera. Uh, these 400 year trajectory also allows us to see uh, the dynamism and staying power of these other slavery and its related forms of involuntary servitude and the tremendous difficulties of ending it. I will end up there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.